בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back, ברוך השם, ברוך השם, we're back on our Wednesday night, stumped the rabbi, we're after some דברי תורה. You guys, בעזרת השם, will ask some questions, and הקדוש ברוך הוא will give us the answers, בעזרת השם. Tonight's shiur is going to be for the רפואה שלמה, for טליה בת שרה. הקדוש ברוך הוא גיבה רפואה שלמה, רפואת הנפש, רפואת הגוף, the uh, young little girl, daughter of Rabbi Ephraim, and Rabbi Sarah is back in the uh, hospital, and we're uh, praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give her another miracle and release her completely healthy this time, uh, and to, to never go back to the hospital aside from Be'ezot Hashem one day to give birth to little tzadikim and tzadikot. Also to Refuah Shlema for Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, Sarah Bat Levana, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides, especially the ones that support us by watching our lectures, supporting our campaigns, and helping us in all the wonderful ways that uh, they can, Baruch Hashem. Uh, just as I give you guys as a uh, reminder, if you haven't watched the uh, videos uh, that we released in the last 24 hours, we released a couple of really important videos. One of them is uh, the uh, campaign, uh, campaign video, the Pesach Kimcha de Pischa uh, campaign. This is the first uh, video that we've uh, published about it. Uh, just showing you guys a little bit of uh, on the ground work. There's actually another video that will be published uh, in the next several hours uh, to show you some more. Uh, just a little taste, a little taste of uh, some of the very hard work uh, that's being done uh, to feed literally thousands and thousands of people, thousands of uh, people in Eretz Yisrael, which Baruch Hashem is uh, a lot of work uh, and uh, a lot of uh, organizing uh, but ultimately, it is uh, extraordinarily uh, rewarding uh, to see all the uh, happy faces, all the wonderful people that, uh, you know, simply didn't think that they're going to have a Chag, didn't think that they're going to uh, have a, uh, uh, such a uh, wonderful gift from a Kadosh Baruch Hu before the holiday. Uh, but uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu made us the Shlichim, the, uh, the messengers, that uh, were able to provide these uh, wonderful families uh, some food uh, and different things they needed for the holiday. Uh, and Baruch Hashem, this year I believe uh, we've uh, reached more uh, people than any other year. It's literally thousands of people. Uh, so we had um, uh, also the Siyum Ashas in one day. Uh, that video hasn't come out yet, but uh, the event itself was already done. We also had... Uh, the uh, chief rabbi of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem and also the former Rishol uh, uh Arav Amar, uh, join us. He was uh, baffled by the, uh, the event and all the amazing things that the organization is doing. Bezat Hashem, uh, that video of the, uh, his, uh, uh, the speeches actually is actually online in Hebrew, but we're going to work on a few other things with it uh, uh, soon. Bezat uh, Hashem. Uh, but that event was uh, well over 500 uh, Avrechim, representing well over 500 families. Uh, each got, uh, you know, uh, money to, uh, to help them with the uh, holiday. Uh, and uh, also each studied Torah for the merit of all of those that uh, are giving and have given uh, to help us uh, in this amazing uh, campaign. Uh, we have uh, some more giving uh, to do. Uh, tomorrow we have a, uh, a couple of uh, cities to go to uh, to feed, uh, to feed uh, several hundred more people. Be'ezot Hashem. So, Baruch Hashem, a lot to do. A lot to do, a lot of work. And uh, all of your uh, giving is very, very much appreciated. Please uh, donate on uh, bhpesach.org. bhpesach.org. That's B as in Be'ezrat. H is in Hashem, Pesach, P E S A C H dot org. Uh, you could donate generously over there uh, and uh, help us uh, feed more uh, people during this uh, holiday, uh, which Bezot Hashem is also going to be uh, some of the things we'll discuss tonight in regards to how much is giving, too much giving, uh, whether it's giving of yourself, giving of your time, giving of your money. Uh, this is certainly a, a very important subject to discuss. And Bezrat Hashem uh, will succeed in doing it. Uh, the other video that we published, which certainly 
uh, was a, a big uh, big win uh, for uh, Team Hashem, which is getting uh, the recording of uh, the uh, number one rabbi in, uh, in, in America and one of the G'dolei Ador, Rav Aaron Feldman, uh, ex- you know, exposing the heresy of Manus Friedman and in so many words uh, saying everything that uh, we've said over the last several years in just less words. Uh, but uh, to have a Gadol uh, speak out uh, against someone is not an easy feat. And uh, needless to say, this was a wonderful surprise for the holidays uh, because uh, people unfortunately don't realize that uh, how how much heresy is coming out of this person's mouth, Manus Friedman's mouth. And uh, through uh, all of what's been happening over the last few days, unfortunately, but fortunately, we found even more heresy uh, that he came out with, uh, and uh, we'll expose that later on, Bezad Hashem. But he's already said enough uh, that uh, Rav Aaron Feldman uh, pretty much not only called him a uh, ignoramus, a ma'aretz, uh, a heretic, and some other uh, uh, descriptions and uh, adjectives uh, that uh, certainly uh, uh, one uh, that's familiar with how the world of Torah works knows that this is not a uh, the same thing as you personally insulting somebody else, uh, you know, by making fun of them. This is a uh, direct attack at the ideology at the false teachings, at the words of heresy that came out of the mouth and uh, the uh, the writings of Manus Friedman. This is what it's all about. It's a, uh, uh, and in the world of Torah, for those of you that still, after all these years, are not used to hearing Torah scholars speak this way, that just simply means you have not learned much Torah. Because if you have learned any responsa books, which is the uh, core foundation of, of the Torah, which is a uh, the uh, sh- they are called in Hebrew shutim, the uh, answers and questions that the sages uh, have published throughout all of the generations. This is exactly uh, what they uh, discuss uh, when uh, talking about specific points. Uh, they mention names, they mention uh, statements, much much harsher than I've ever said. But uh, the politically correct world that we live in today. Uh, is apparently, uh, you know, uh, is uh, not accustomed to hearing, uh, uh, you know, rabbis uh, calling people heretics. Uh, and uh, they think automatically it's Lashon Ra, automatically it's bad, automatically it's Sinat Chinam, and all types of catchphrases that they heard in, uh, you know, in some video or some uh, local lecture that they think applies everywhere, like a one-size-fits-all, even if the Gdola Dor is saying it, like literally... A person should humble themselves even a little bit to realize that if if a, a, a commoner is saying something and you disagree, that's one thing. But if a gdolado, someone that's dedicated literally nearly a century of their life learning Torah, you have the audacity to disagree with them, to actually say that what they're saying is wrong, and even more so to call it a sin, like just a little bit of humility and common sense automatically should remove that stupid thought from your head. Uh, but needless to say, the Tum'ah that uh, Manus Friedman feeds into people's minds certainly will cause them to make foolish decisions like that. Uh, but needless to say, this video is very important, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more of uh, Chachmei Israel, the uh, Chachamim of Am Israel, join this war against the heresy uh, that's out there today, that's poisoning the minds of innocent Jews and Gentiles alike uh, with a conniving smile and a uh, sarcastic uh, humor that seems innocent, but unfortunately is uh, worse than a cobra's venom. Either way, the video is out there, and Bo Hashem, people are shocked. Uh, many people have already, uh, that have seen our videos in the past, uh, you know, and uh, just assumed that we were wrong, uh, have already uh, realized that uh, they are wrong, and uh, everything we've said already for years has, has been correct, uh, because it's in accordance to the Torah. This is not an applause to me, this is simply uh, the fact that we follow Da Torah, we have our Rav, Rav Ephraim, who is a Dayan, who is a, uh, a giant Chacham that has written over 50 books, 
who has uh, gotten the uh, respect of G'dolei Ado across the world, uh, who guides us in every single step that we do. So there was never even a second that we thought that uh, we were in the wrong, but unfortunately, uh, the world will call you crazy until they'll call you a genius. Uh, and uh, that's just the way the world works. So with that being said, we have, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, a season of uh, holidays uh, where uh, Pesach is upon us. Uh, then, of course, we uh, during uh, the second day of Pesach, we start the uh, Sfirat HaOmer, uh, you know, a uh, time we'll talk about when it's, you know, more, uh, you know, more, more relevant. Uh, then, of course, we have Lagba Omer. We have a lot going on. But, of course, the uh, Exodus, Kriyat Yamsuf, all of these amazing things are uh, what we're about to celebrate. Uh, but at the same token, we cannot forget our very, very dear Parasha, Parashat Shavua, Parashat Metzora. You know, I know that everyone is... Uh, very uh, busy with preparing for the holiday, cleaning the closets, cleaning the fridge, cleaning everything, cleaning the walls. But you cannot forget about cleaning the neshama. And one of the most important things in cleaning the neshama is allowing yourself to receive a rebuke and know that if you heard it, that means Akadosh Baruch Hu sent it. If you heard it, that means a Kadosh Baruch Hu sent it. And when a person does not accept rebuke upon themselves and they simply look elsewhere, they think that it's, you no, know, they heard it, but it's not relevant to them. It's relevant to their friends. It's relevant to their spouse. It's relevant to their kids. If you heard it, that means it's relevant to you. Why? Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu has an infinite amount of choices of Torah to bring to your table. If he chose to bring this to you, that means it's relevant to you whenever you may hear this, whether it's today, tomorrow, 20 years from now, whenever that time may be, uh, you know, the, this is relevant to you. And the same thing goes with all Musar, all, uh, all, all uh, forms of Musar. If you're hearing it, it's certainly relevant to you. Now, the topic is giving. How much is too much giving because we've all heard the term uh you know give it all give it your all give it everything leave everything on the on the field all types of expressions that you know in essence are trying to uh, uh give you the message that you should try your hardest give everything you can that's nice to say but how many of us can truly say that we really apply it in our life especially when it comes to giving something we don't want to give. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you get a gift, especially when you're a young kid, you get a gift, your parents bought you something, and you get a nice toy or something, and then all of a sudden, one of your brothers or sisters, you know, wants to play with it too. And you're like, oh, but it's my toy. Yeah, everyone knows it's your toy. You're the one that got the gift, but just because it's yours doesn't mean you shouldn't share. Yeah, but it's mine. No one is saying it's not yours. But why are you so stingy with your stuff? And this is something that a person already is born with. Uh, and if you don't work on it, you will end up being not only a person that's very stingy uh, and uh, very, uh, uh, you know, full of problems in your life and marriage and so on, but you'll also be a miserable person because ultimately the greatest happiness is achieved through giving, not receiving. This is the reason why people that give tend to be happy, whereas people that uh, uh, have a lot uh, don't necessarily uh, have happiness. You know, you have uh, suicide uh, in reports that came out of the U.S. government uh, several years ago report that uh, over 71% of the people that commit suicide, meaning people that kill themselves, they get to such a point of depression and uh, mental instability uh, and misery that they literally kill themselves. This, you would think, would be a problem for poor people. But you would be wrong. Why? Because over 71% of the people that commit suicide 
are middle to upper class. In so many words, it's a rich person's problem. People that have more many times end up being more miserable. And it's not because they have more, but rather because they don't know what to do with it once they have it. Because they don't realize that having it is not necessarily going to give you the happiness, but rather giving it could, not necessarily guarantee would, but could help you uh, gain happiness. Either way, why, why is giving even a topic that's even relevant to Parashat Metzora? Parashat Metzora continues the discussion of the spiritual disease of Tzarat. Uh, it also talks about the, uh, the different punishments that Hashem gives to people that are immoral, uh, whether it's the uh, being a Zav or a Zava, which is uh, disgusting liquids coming out of the Brit without a person's control. Uh, and uh, in essence, it's a form of punishment that brings a high level of tuma on the person where they cannot be next to anybody else. They uh, they have anything that they sit on, including if they sit on, uh, you know, a horse. Uh, let's say you have the the stable on top of the horse. That stable cannot be used by anybody else. Anyone else that touches it will become tameh. Uh, if they lay on a bed, that bed is tameh, literally a disaster, a, a spiritual disaster that does not go away until the person does tshuva, and literally they know for a fact that Hashem forgave them, because otherwise they will continue having this disease, and anyone that wants to know more about it, it's Gemara Masichet Brachot, talks extensively about it, it's really literally a very disgusting disease, uh, but it's a punishment, it's a very, very serious punishment, that uh, is only challenged by the other punishment, which is Tzarat. Tzarat, that is a punishment from Hashem for people that say Lashon Ara, people that uh, speak gossip, uh, people that uh, do all types of things that are detestable in the eyes of Hashem. Uh, and literally, they are now impure. They have a physical and spiritual disease. They're kicked out of the camp. You can't touch them. If you see them, you have to scream out, Tame, Tame, and embarrass them uh, in so many words because that's part of their tikkun. In so many words, a disaster, another disaster. This disaster, this disaster. Zenevela zetrefa. Like, this is a uh, you know a, a dead animal. This is a unkosherly uh, slaughtered animal. Both of them you can't uh, do anything good with. So what does this have to do with giving? Well, we see that when these people do tshuva and God forgives them and the disease starts, you know, goes away even if sometimes the tzarat is on the house the walls of the house have tzarat, literally there's such uh, impurity that even the house could be affected green and, 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 and red stripes appear all over the walls, uh, of course this was also a uh, one of the ways that Hashem uses an opportunity to, uh, to give uh, 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 sustenance to Am Yisrael, but again, this was not a, uh, uh, just because he wanted to give them something. This is also because they made sins. The point being is, is that uh, when a person does tshuva and stops speaking gossips, stops speaking uh, uh, things that are against the Torah, stops being immoral and Hashem forgives them, they start healing. And as soon as the disease goes away and uh, they see that they have become pure, they go to the Kohen, the Kohen confirms that they are pure and then they have to do a whole sacrificial service in order to complete their tshuva. They have to bring different animals and sacrifice them as part of their thank you to Hashem that He forgave them, but also I'm sorry to Hashem that they're even in this position in the first place. And it's very expensive. Meaning, if you messed up by saying, one time you said Lashon Ara about the rabbi, one time you said Lashon Ara about someone that's a kosher person, Literally, the amount of suffering that a person gets, if you just read this parasha, you don't even have to 
Read Parashat Bechukotai or Kitavo, all the other punishments that happen to really, really horrible sinners. Literally, if you just read the process of tshuva for someone that said Lashon Ara, and they get Sarat, what they have to go through, how much suffering and agony they have to go through in this world, all of the discoloring in their skin, their hair starts growing in strange places, places that were bald start growing hair. Literally, they become like a little monster. They become like a little monster. It's literally like hideous. Why? He said that a kosher person is not a kosher person. He said, she said, something against the Torah. Hashem punishes. Many times people say, how come Hashem doesn't make open miracles like he did at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu? This is the reason. Because, because he gave open miracles, he also judged right away because there was no question of whether there was a God you knew there was a God you heard and you saw his words so if you heard and you saw his words and you still went against the Torah punishment right on the spot right on the spot you say listen you know he was a good rabbi he helped me do tshuva but you know what I don't like the way he, uh, he sent me that message that told me that I'm wrong so I'm not going to listen to him and I'm also going to tell my uh, friends not to listen to him either. You made a decision such as that. You made a statement such as that. Don't be surprised if you start having strange hairs coming out of your forehead and colors that even the strongest dye is not going to help. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu punished quickly. Punished quickly. And literally, when a person looks at what happened to the people that had sarat, or the people that were zavim, where they literally had to walk with it, instead of underwear, they had to walk with a sack. Disgusting. Hideous. Why? They went against Hashem. With something that people today do every day. We have an entire industry built on it. It's called the news. It's called media. It's called the Ganon parties that I've been talking about for the last six months where young women and old women get together. Why? They want to talk about people. That's what we call Ganon parties. Why? Everyone in that little get-together, that little having a coffee together, chit-chatting about what she did and what he did and what the neighbor did and who got divorced and who got married and who you like and who got fat and who got skinny and who got divorced and all those things you talk about, that's called Ganom party. Why? Everyone there is going to Ganom. Why? For that coffee shop. We're talking about people. Oh, come on, Rabbi, you're being extreme. Read the details of this parasha and you're going to say, Rabbi, you're not extreme enough. You're not extreme enough. You're like, uh, you're being too soft. You're not telling us the truth. Truth is much worse than what you say. Literally, you see what happens to a person that has tzarat. So now, after this person got the picture, did tshuva, she did tshuva, she realized that she made a mistake. She says, I'm sorry, to all of the appropriate people, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu forgives. El Rachum Vechanun. He's the God that's merciful. So now, Tzarat starts to go away. And what happens? She has to go to her husband and say, Honey, you know that uh, 20,000, 25,000 we have on the side for a rainy day, for a vacation, for the new car, all that stuff. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, honey. Yeah, sure. What? Uh, yeah, I need it. Why, we're going on vacation? No, not exactly. What, what do you need it for? I need it to bring the korbanot. What do you mean you need it for the korbanot? No, no, no. Give them like $100. No, no, honey, you can't do that. I have to buy korbanot. If not, I'm going to stay impure forever and you're never going to be able to sleep in the same bed, hold my hand, even eat with the same spoon and knife that I ate from. Okay, honey, here's the bank account. Why? That's the way it is. But what happens, Rabotai Karim, what happens? What happens if a person doesn't have money? Meaning, he made a mistake. 
she made a mistake. Went against the Torah. Akadosh Baruch Hu punished them. But when it came down to bringing the sacrifices after they did tshuva, they don't have money for uh, bringing three uh, three uh, lambs and all of these other things. They don't have the money for that. Well, first of all, you should know there is a special service for poor people. But it's not free. It's not free. Even if you're poor, you have to come up with some money. But nonetheless, we see that the Torah has a special discount available for people that are genuinely poor, not genuinely cheap. You know, there's a difference. There are people that are genuinely poor, meaning they don't actually have any money. And then there are people that are genuinely cheap. What's, gen- what's the difference? One doesn't have money. The other one pretends like they don't have any money. Oh, wow. It costs $2,000 for tefillin? Nah, that's too much. Is there, is there, is there like, a, is there like a, a charity, you could, a fundraiser? You can, you can get for me, Rabbi, that people can uh, donate for so I can buy tefillin? Is there like a fundraiser that you could uh, get for me so I could uh, get a new car? Is there like a fundraiser or people that you know, Rabbi, that uh, can uh, get me a trip to Israel? Because I really need it for my neshama. I need to go on vacation. Maybe you could raise some money for me so I can go on vacation? Now, all of these things are funny to you probably. But every one of these requests I've actually received in real life more than once. Why? Because people are genuinely cheap, not poor. Today, Baruch Hashem, many people, especially in Western society, i.e. America, for those who do not know how the map works, are doing okay. Not everyone. Certainly there are poor people, and that's actually... A, uh, a gift from Hashem for the people that have money, and which we'll discuss later on, why there's poor people, even though it's difficult for the poor people. But nonetheless, there are many poor people in Israel, America, all over. But overall, Jews are doing okay. Overall, Jews, especially the ones that are in Western society, that are working Sometimes even more than one job, sometimes even a job that uh, gets them uh, to make uh, you know, six figures or more, they're doing okay. Now, the fact that people feel like they're struggling or that they are still stingy and they don't want to donate $2,000, they don't want to spend $2,000 on tefillin, they don't want to buy a mezuzah for $150, they want a discount or better yet, they want you to get the money for them. They want you to get the money for them. They want to go to Israel, but they don't want to spend the money. They want to keep the money for a rainy day. I'm not sure what kind of rainy day. Maybe the Mabul, maybe. Maybe they're waiting to buy a Tevat Noach because uh, of what's happening in a generation. But nonetheless, they don't want to spend the money. Why? You know, the money is, uh, is dear to them. I worked hard for this, Rabbi. I worked hard for this. I don't want to spend the money. I don't want to spend it. So what do you have it for? What are you going to keep it for? Are you the type of person that by the time you take out $100 out of your pocket, George Washington is sleeping? He's already, he never thought that he would ever see the light of day. He puts glasses on because he first, the first time he saw the sun. Unfortunately, Rabotai Karim, being cheap is a disease. But sometimes being cheap with money is not the biggest problem a person has. Sometimes the biggest problem a person has is being stingy with words. He's too cheap to give his wife a compliment. She's too cheap to give her husband a compliment. They're too cheap to give their kids, their kids, a compliment or even tell them I love you. I have some people tell me, listen, uh, Rabbi, I I really uh, have a hard time in my marriage because... My wife wants me to tell her I love you, but I never heard those words in my life. I said, what do you mean you never heard? Didn't your parents tell you I love you? He says, not even once. Your parents never told you I love you even once? I've had more than one person tell me they've literally never heard the parents ever say I love you. 
Why the parents didn't? Obviously, they probably came from a house that was just like that. They also never heard the word, I love you. But sometimes people are so cheap with words, they don't know how to give a compliment. They don't know how to give encouragement. They don't know how to express themselves inappropriately. This is also a form of stinginess. Needless to say, the Torah tells us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu hates stinginess. Even more so, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us laws of how to treat the poor people. And poor doesn't always mean poor as a result of lack of money. Poor could actually be somebody that's in need of anything, even if he is actually rich, as far as money is concerned. He's rich in money, but he doesn't have cash. And he needs you to help him with some cash so he could do a few things because all of his money is in buildings, is in all types of assets. So he is considered poor, according to the Allahic definition, for you to help him, for you to be obligated to help him. Other times a person is poor in different ways. But the point is, is that there is a laws in regards to how to treat the poor, the obvious common uh, uh, knowledge poor and other types of poor and one of the places you will see it inside the torah as one of the 613 mitzvot is in the book of deuteronomy sefer dvarim chapter 15 verse number seven has the foundational teachings of Tzedakah. The Torah tells us here the foundational teachings of giving. And eventually we'll get to the point of understanding what's too much giving. Because, okay, I give, but if I could just give $10, is that enough? $100 is enough? $1,000 is enough? $1 million dollars enough? How much is enough? An hour of my time enough? Two hours of my time enough? Five hours of my time enough? How much is enough? How much is too much? Torah says, if there shall be a destitute person among you, any of your brethren in any of your cities, in your land that Hashem your God gives you, you shall not harden your heart or close your hand against your destitute brother. Rather, you shall open your hand to him. You shall lend him his requirement, whatever is lacking to him. Beware lest there be a lawless thought in your heart saying, the seventh year approaches, this is a person that thinks that he's going to lose as a result of giving. And in so many words, Hashem, gives him a warning, and then after that, gives him a promise that everything's going to be okay, which again, I'm going to read this a few times today. So, this is the original source. This is the original source. Now, Rabutai, we have to go to Moreno Verabenu, Ateret Roshenu, the Rambam, in Sefer HaMitzvot, we need the Rambam to tell us. Not your own, Reuven. We need the Rambam to tell us that this is a biblical mitzvah. The Rambam. Sefer HaMitzvot. Mitzvah number 232. The Rambam says, there's a negative commandment that HaKadosh Baruch Hu prohibited us from, from withholding the giving of charity and relief to our poor brothers. And the Rambam clarifies that this mitzvah applies when these conditions are met. Number one, we're made aware of their difficult situation. And two, that we are in a position to help. Because just because you just heard that somebody in your community, or even if it's not in your community, somebody in Eretz Israel is poor, 
doesn't mean that you're automatically obligated to help them. What if you yourself don't have food to eat? So what, if you don't do it, then you go, you, you get a sin? No. If you don't have the ability to help, you don't get a sin. The question is, how you define that you don't have the ability to help. Because if you are made aware that there are needy people, but yet you're not in a position to help, you don't have a problem. But if you are in a position to help and you choose not to help, now you have a problem. Now you have a problem. And that is what the Rambam is telling us here that the exalted God said in the Torah, where we just looked in the book of Deuteronomy, do not harden your heart and do not close your hand to your poor brother. This verse is the prohibition against acquiring stingy and miserly traits as to refrain from acting in a proper manner, meaning withholding giving when giving is warranted. This is one of the places. Here we see that to give is not only something you should do, but if you want to be a kosher Jew, you have to do. It's an obligation to give tzedakah. In fact, it's a sin not to give. So there's multiple places, which we're going to elaborate in further, but we need more clarity. We know that if we're made aware that someone's having a difficult situation, people don't have food to eat, a widow doesn't have a job, but she has kids that need to eat because, you know, even though they're kids, they still need to eat. And you have in a position to give her a few hundred dollars, but... You really want to use the few hundred dollars to get yourself a, uh, a, new, uh, a new phone. Even though you already have a phone. Guess what? If you choose to buy that phone instead of giving her, you may find yourself with a problem between you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you the extra money not because he wanted you to get another phone. Now sometimes a person says, listen, I need to save money. I need to save money because I'm trying to buy a house. And the house today, if you live in America, you want to live in a Jewish community in New York, Florida, Jersey, Baltimore, Los Angeles, you got to have a lot of money. Even if you're borrowing 90% of the money from the bank, you still have to have a few hundred thousand dollars down payment. So persons, listen Every penny counts right now. Why? I'm trying to raise two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars so I could buy a house for my family, for my kids, for this, for that. So I could only give a hundred dollars to help the poor people in Eretz Israel because the three, four, five, six hundred thousand I have in the bank, I needed to buy a house. According to the Rambam, you have a problem. According to Shukhan Aruch, you have a problem. According to the Chinuch, you have a problem. According to the smak, you have a problem. According to HaKadosh Baruch you have a problem. Why? No one told you give everything you have. But to give so little when you have so much, why? Because you're saving? Who told you you're even allowed to save? Who told you you're allowed to save? Why? I'm being responsible. No one's saying to be not responsible. But a person needs to know the laws. So that's why we have to go deeper. We need to ask the Rambam for more help. Rambam has more clarity on this mitzvah of giving. In the Mishneh Torah, in Ilchot Matanot Aniim, Gifts to the Poor, Chapter 7, First Alacha. He tells us an additional mitzvah. It is a positive commandment to give tzedakah to the poor among the Jewish people. This, by the way, is also agreed upon by the Sefer HaChinuch as mitzvah number 479, which we'll get into in a moment. It is another one of the 613 mitzvot, meaning... Not to give is a violation and is one of the 630 mitzvot. To give is one of the 630 mitzvot. So you're talking about two completely different mitzvot. How much to give? Rambam will tell us. 
It's a positive commandment to give tzedakah to the poor among the Jewish people according to what is appropriate for the poor person. What does that mean? You have to give not in according to you, but in according to the poor person. Again, assuming you are aware and are in a position, you can't just give whatever you want. There are rules for giving. If this is within the financial capacity of the donor, sources, Sefer Dvarim, chapter 15, verse number 5, which we just read, which says, you shall certainly open your hand to him. Also in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 35, you shall support him, a stranger and a resident, they shall live with you. And also, Leviticus 25, verse 36, and your brother shall live with you. Here, the Rambam tells us we have to give. It's an obligation, not a good deed, just to be nice. Two, you have to give in accordance to the poor person's standards, not your standards. And again, poor person doesn't only mean a person that doesn't have money. Poor person could also be somebody that used to be rich. Which the Rambam actually clarifies in another halacha, that if the person used to be rich, and he lost all of his money, it's halacha number three, in chapter seven, he was rich, he lost all of his money, you now have to feed him the same level of food that he ate when he was rich. You can't give him oatmeal that you bought for uh, 50 cents. If he was used to eating steak, kosher steak for $25 a day, and you have the means to feed him that, you have to feed him that. You have to feed him $25 a day steak. If he was used to, the Rambam says, to ride around town with a horse and a servant that runs in front of him to give him honor, if you have the means, because you yourself are successful, you have to help this formerly rich person according to his standards. You have to get him a horse and a carriage and some people to run in front of him. In today's world, you have to get him a, you know, like a, a Bentley with a driver. Why? Because he is poor, but of a different standard than the guy that uh, most people think about when they think poor, they think about somebody homeless. So then the Rambam already takes us to a different world when we're thinking about giving. Now what's giving? First, you should know that Chachamim clarified that a person is not obligated to give to the point where they have to borrow money in order to give. You don't have to go borrow money. You have to give based on what you have. Again, what you really have, not what you imagine to have. Because some people... They have money, but they imagine like they're poor. Two, you're not obligated to give more than 20% of your money to the poor. Not obligated to give more than 20% of your money to give to the poor. Most people say 20%, what 20%? If I give the guy $100, it's already a lot. And that's less than 1%. Yeah, that's the problem. Alakha number two. Anyone who sees a poor person asking and turns his eyes away from him and does not give him tzedakah, does not give him charity, transgresses the Torah's negative commandment. As the Torah says in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7, do not harden your heart or close your hand against your brother. The poor person. So here we see that to simply reject somebody that came to your attention is not exactly the best choice. Not exactly the best choice if a person wants to go to heaven. Al-Khan number five. How much to give? 
How much to give? The Rambam says, when a poor person comes and asks for his needs to be met, and the giver does not have the financial capacity, he should give him according to his financial capacity. How much is that? The most desirable way of performing a mitzvah is to give one-fifth of one's financial resources, 20%. Giving 10% is an ordinary measure. Giving less than 10% reflects stinginess, parsimony. See, here the Rambam is telling us, if you're giving ma'asil, you're giving 10% of your money, not in one shot. You're giving, let's say, every year you give 10% of your money, Throughout the year, I wouldn't recommend giving 10% or, or the majority of your tzedakah in one shot. You should give throughout the year. If you're giving 10%, most people don't give 10%. But if they do, you know, they give themselves a, a few pats on the back that they give 10%. According to the Rambam, that's normal. Giving 10%, that just puts you in a category of normal. If you're giving less than 10%, you have a stamp certificate sent from 800 years ago, waiting for you in the mail, from the Rambam saying, you have a stinginess problem. Why? You should be giving at least 10%, but in reality, the most desirable way of performing the mitzvah is giving 20%. Now many people think that 20% is the maximum you're allowed to give across the board. This is not true. To clarify... 20% is the maximum you're allowed to give for the poor people, the needy, because you don't want to become poor. But if you're giving for the sake of publicizing Torah, sponsoring Torah, there's no limit to how much you give, especially if the person is, has much more money than what they need. If the guy is making two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, and he only really needs 50, 60, a hundred thousand out of that to live, he should certainly give more than 20%, especially if he makes even more than that. People that are making millions or have millions certainly should give a lot more than that. But the point being is, is that most people don't even give 10%. So when you tell them 20%, they think, nah, come on, that's crazy. Maybe only poor people give 20% because they don't have much to give. And you're right. Many times the people that actually give 20% are usually poor. And it's not because it's a smaller test. It's also a big test. In fact, they have less. But rather because usually when people are poor, they have an easier time to connecting to Hashem through the uh, difficulties that they have. And many times they're much more charitable. Either way, the mitzvah of giving is not one that most people understand. Furthermore, the Rambam says, and this exact halacha was paskin in the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch, Yore De'a, chapter 251. Halacha number 10. Mi sheba ve'amar ha'echiluni, en botkim acharav imu ramai, ela ma'achilin oto miyad. Aya ero muba ve'amar, kasuni, botkin acharav imu ramai, v'i makirin oto mechasin oto miyad. Shuchan Aruch says as follows, and this is what the Rambam already said before the Shuchan Aruch. When a poor person that you don't know comes and he says, I'm hungry, provide me food, feed me. We don't investigate whether he's a thief, a criminal or not. We feed him right away without delay. You don't ask him, where'd you come from? How come you don't have any food? Who's your mother? What community are you from? You don't ask those questions. He's hungry. He asks you to feed him right away. No questions. Gemara Masechet Ta'anit says, the rabbi of Rabbi Akiva for 22 years was Nachum Ish Gamzu. Nachum is Gamzu was Kodesh Kodeshim. He's the one that coined the phrase Gamzu Tova. This too for the good. One time a poor person came up to him and said, feed me. And Nachum is Gamzu was getting off of his donkey and said, one minute, I'll get it for you. The guy was literally didn't eat three days. 
couldn't even deal with the fact that he had to wait another minute, he died on the spot. Nachum Ishgamzu felt so bad that he prayed for himself to suffer for the rest of his life. And he ended up suffering immensely. He lost his arms and his legs. His whole body was full of uh, uh, a, uh, uh, all types of infections like Job. And he brought this on himself as a tikkun. For what? For saying to the poor man that asked for food, one minute, hold on one minute. He wasn't saying no to him. He's just saying one minute. Why? Because the halacha says, don't say one minute. Somebody says, feed me, right away you go get the food. Don't even say one minute. But what if he's a criminal? You don't ask those questions. Food, you don't ask those questions. On the other hand, the Rambam says, if he comes unclothed, and he says, clothe me, guy comes in without a shirt, guy comes in without pants, the guy comes in barely wearing any clothes, not because he's uh, immodest. He doesn't have any clothes. He's so poor, he doesn't have any clothes. Or his uh, pants have so many holes in them, it looks like he's wearing shorts. And he says, give me clothes. Here the Rambam says, oh, hold on a second. Him, we investigate. What do we investigate? We investigate if he's a deceiver, if he's a thief. Maybe this is a, this is a criminal. Why doesn't he have any clothes? If he asks for food, we don't ask any questions. But if he comes with no clothes, could be a crime. Could be a criminal. We ask, where'd you come from? Where do you live? Who, what, when? But, the Rambam says, if you know him not to be a criminal, you don't make him wait for a second, immediately you go get him the clothes, just like you would get somebody food. Point is, we don't just give blindly to everyone, but there are certain conditions you have to give right away. There are certain conditions you have to give right away. Now, what if a person doesn't want to give? I don't want to give. He wants to keep everything to himself. Says the Rambam in Ilchot Matanot Le'ev Yonim, Matanot La'anim, chapter 7, Alakha number 10. When a person does not want to give charity or he desires to give less than what is appropriate for him meaning he has an income of let's just say a hundred thousand two hundred thousand a year he doesn't want to give maser he doesn't want to give 20 percent to help am Yisrael do tshuva he doesn't want to give 10 percent for am Yisrael to learn torah in fact he doesn't want to give 10 percent even to feed am Yisrael he doesn't want to give. He said, okay, you know what? Give nine, give eight. No, no, no. Go work. What do you mean go work? But you have money. You're making 200000 a year. You live in a half a million dollar house, million dollar house. Give a few thousand. No. Not giving. There you go. You know what? Yeah, I'll give you $10. Go away. Today, there's nothing you can do about it. At the time that the rabbis, the sages had power, where the rabbis were strong, the days of the, uh, of the Rambam, the days where G'dolei Ador were respected, the Rambam says this is what the halacha would be for a guy that doesn't want to give. He doesn't want to give, or he wants to give less than what is appropriate for him. The court should compel him to give and give him makot for his rebellious conduct until he gives the amount that it was estimated that he should give. And if he still doesn't want to give, the court takes possession of his property and the appropriate, expropriate the amount that is appropriate for him to give. In so many words, he doesn't give, they start giving him. Trach, after trach, until he says, yeah, yeah, I know, I forgot I wanted to give. I forgot I wanted to give you guys 20,000. I forgot that I like Kiruv. I forgot Rabbi Reuben is my favorite rabbi. I forgot. I forgot that he's the one that helps people do tshuva. I forgot. Here you go, guys. Make payable to who? Okay, no problem. I forgot that I have to give. I forgot that it was a Jew. 
But if he's one of these stubborn people, said, no, the 20,000, no way, I'm not giving. Why? I want to keep the money. I want to build my portfolio. I'm saving for retirement. As if anybody assures you that you're going to live till next week even. He's saving for 20 years from now, 30 years from now. The rabbis would get it out of him, either by hitting him, but if he's stubborn, simply they would take over his property and take the money and then say, okay, thank you, now you gave. Now this wasn't only 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. At the time of the Stipler Gaon and Arab Shach, there was one millionaire that uh, came to the rabbi and said, I want to give charity, I have some, uh, a few million dollars, I want to start a foundation, and I want you guys to be on the uh, board. No problem, we'll help you, give to yeshivot, give to good things. All right, so they set it up, everything is good. In the beginning, everything started good. One day, the guy got, the guy got some stupid ideas, and he starts writing checks to all types of forbidden causes he wants to help the local zoo build a cage for the elephant for five hundred thousand dollars instead of helping the yeshiva feed the people instead of helping am Yisrael, he wants to feed the elephant gives the check check bounces calls the bank what's going on says the check bounced it didn't go through yeah why it's my money go no 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 this is a foundation the check went through. We had to get the other, the other signers, Arab Shach and Estaipel Lagaon, to sign. We brought it to them. They said, no sign. They ripped the check. No check. Nothing. He came furious to Arab Shach. Said, hey, what are you doing? I have a few million dollars. I want to give to this. Arab Shach knew this guy and his attitude. He says, listen, Go speak to the stipler. Rav Kanievsky. Go speak to him. Rav Yaakov Kanievsky, go speak to him. He'll explain to you. This guy thought he was strong. Went to Rav Kanievsky, to the stipler Gaon. Hey, what's going on? I have money. The stipler Gaon raised his eyes from the sefer, sees the sky, gets up and starts screaming at him and starts waving his stick after him. He got so scared, literally, he ran out, never came back again. Never came back again. From that moment on, the tzedakah from that fund went only to the appropriate places. Why? That's what the Torah says. Your money is not really your money. HaKadosh Baruch is simply using you as a bank account. And that's actually what the Chovot HaLevavot says a thousand years ago. He says, why does a Kadosh Baruch Hu make wicked people sometimes rich? Sometimes wicked people, Hashem gives them a lot of money. Why? The Chovot HaLevavot writes that a Kadosh Baruch Hu needs to give money to all the righteous people, to feed them, to have things for them. But sometimes the, it's not the time to give it to them. It's not the time. Or it's not necessarily money. So what does he do? He gives some wicked person, he gives him the money. That guy says, you know what? I'm going to use this money. I'm going to build a company. And this company is going to manufacture all types of cement. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Why? He's going to make cement. He's going to make money. And he thinks he's successful. And he's chasing after money. He's building, 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 making more and more and more money. But some of the stuff that he's building, Hashem is only allowing it because the tzaddik or the tzaddikim need to use it. He builds a bridge because the tzaddik needs to cross the bridge one day. He builds a building because the tzaddik needs an office in the building. He builds a road because the tzaddik needs to use the road to go to work every day, to go learn every day, to go teach every day. But also... He gives the wicked some money so he could use him as a bank to store the money until Hashem decides to take that money 
and give and disperse it to different righteous people that he wants to give it to. In so many words, Hashem, one of the reasons why Hashem gives money to the wicked people is so he, he can use them as a bank in order for him to disperse sustenance to his righteous people in a natural way. In a natural way, not in a supernatural way. Another reason why he gives money to the wicked people is also a form of punishment, as everybody already knows, which we've mentioned many times over the years. As it says in Parashat Vayit Hanan, the one before last verse of the parasha, where it says, Meshalem el sonav el panav la'avido, Hashem pays cash to his haters in order to destroy them, meaning he pays them reward for whatever decent things they did in their life in this world because they lost their olam haba. So he gives them whatever good they deserve in this world because this is the last time they'll have any good. But nonetheless, the other reason is because he's using them as a bank. Now, Rabotai, the Rambam says that if a person doesn't want to give, the sages had the power to force him. But this is not possible in most cases today. <clears throat> Needless to say, a person has to be the, the police of himself and not make Hashem do it for him. Make Hashem do it for him. Why? Because if a person ignores the Torah, they could put themselves in a very terrible situation. And the Rambam writes in chapter 8, Alakha number 10, where it talks about Pidyon Shvuim, which is using money or, or, or using any type of ways to redeem the captives, to really, you know, that are prisoners. Like we have Shem Rachem now in Gaza, Yimach Shimam Bezicham, these, these terrorists still have our brothers and sisters as prisoners. So redeeming the captives, the Rambam writes, receives priority over sustaining the poor. And there's no greater mitzvah than redeeming the captives when it comes to this. The captive is hungry, thirsty, unclothed, and also life risk. And if someone pays no attention to his redemption... He violates the Torah. He violates the Torah. Negative commandment of do not harden your heart. And also, do not stand when the blood of your neighbor is in danger. And also, he shall not oppress him with exhausting work in your presence. And also, and he has negated the observance of a positive commandment, which is a, uh, uh, you shall uh, certainly open up your hand to him. And... Your brother shall live with you and love your neighbor as yourself and save those who are taken for death and many more decrees of this nature. In so many words, the Rambam says that if you don't, if you ignore the possibility of helping a prisoner, a Jewish prisoner, get freed, you're making no less than eight cents. What does this have to do with giving? If you notice... You look at this Alakha more closely. Out of the eight sins that the Rambam mentioned, five of them have to do with tzaka, meaning that if somebody doesn't give appropriately or doesn't give at all, they're making no less than five crimes against Hashem. Five sins, five lavim. Now we need more support. So we go to the Chinuch. Because the Chinuch is going to clarify some things for us. The Chinuch, mitzvah number 478, writes as follows. We're commanded not to withhold acts of kindness and staka from our Jewish brothers, and certainly not from our relatives. If we are aware of their weak financial situation and we have the means to assist them, and he brings the same verses to support it. Meaning, again, the same conditions as the Rambam, where if you're aware that someone, that a Jewish brother, whether it's your relative or not, is irrelevant. If it's your relative, he comes before a stranger. But if your relatives are all fine, but there is another Jew that 
it came to your attention as a need and you have knowledge and the ability to help and you choose not to you have a very serious problem you're making no less than five sins no less than five sins And the Chinuch says that this mitzvah is, uh, begins as soon as a person becomes aware of the financial difficulties of some, a needy person. Meaning as soon as you found out that a person is in need, without them asking you, if they asked you, obviously, but even if, you don't, if they never asked you, like some people say, listen, if he comes to me, I'll help him. No, no, no. If you found out there's someone in your community or even not in your community that is in need and you have the means to help them, the obligation begins right at that time. Right at that time it begins for you to help them. And every second you let go by, it's not looking good. Furthermore, the Chinuch says, do not allow the trait of stinginess and callousness gain control over you and hold you back from helping your brother in need. Rather, make sure to imbue your heart with the trait of generosity and compassion and assist your brother in any way that you can. As the Torah later adds words of reassurance, saying, Don't think that through this matter of giving tzedakah, you will experience the loss and depletion of your funds. Because in return for giving tzedakah, Hashem will bless you. And His blessing, even if it's for just one short moment of your life, is better for you than many storehouses of gold and silver. See here the... Chinuch clarifies further than what the Rambam told us so far, where he says, listen, this stinginess that's controlling your heart that makes you too cheap to buy yourself a normal tefillin, too cheap to get yourself a normal suit for Shabbat, too cheap to give ma'asev, to support Torah, to help poor people, to fulfill your mitzvot, too cheap. It's not just bad. It's horrible. Why? Because this type of trait is controlling your mind and your heart to the point where you start thinking that you're the one that's in charge of how much you have, where if you give tzedakah, that means you'll have less. This is heresy. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides how much you have. And needless to say, says the Chinuch, that if you give to support your Jewish brothers, to support the Torah, you think Hashem will punish you by making you have less as a result? Chas v'shalom to think such a thing. In fact, not only will you gain out of giving, but you'll also have a blessing from Hashem for whatever you do have, which is worth storehouses and storehouses of gold much more than you can ever have. See here, the Chinuch is telling us that the blessing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has is really the biggest blessing you can possibly imagine because a person can make a few hundred thousand a year or a few hundred million a year, but have no blessing in his money which means that the money that they're getting, they're not actually going to enjoy it. And that's actually one of the things that most people don't realize. Where the book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Dvarim chapter 15 verse 10 specifically says that you shall surely give him and let your heart not feel bad when you give him. For in return for this matter, Hashem your God will bless you in all your deeds and in your every undertaking. And the Me'iri comments in the Gemara Maseret Baba Batra, where he says how foolish it is for a person to think that they will lose as a result of giving tzedakah. Why? You're thinking 
that the less you give tzedaka, the more you're going to be financially secure because you'll have more. This is a mistake. Why? Because you'll be as a result of not giving, number one, you're missing out on the opportunity of fixing your crimes because one of the things that tzedakah does is that it makes up for sins. You made sins, you stole money, you wasted seed, you were with the nida, you were uh, immoral, you did all types of sins. One of the ways that Hashem allows us to fix those sins is with tzedakah to support, to use the tzedakah to support poor people, to support Torah. It's actually a tool for tshuva. Now, you're not going to have that. And as a result of that, those sins, you're going to have no blessing. Furthermore, a person will end up finding himself spending the money that he has. Instead of spending it on tzedakah, he'll end up spending it on all types of expenses that were unexpected. Lawyers, doctors, fines, problems, medical expenses, all types of horrible things no one ever wants to use money for. And he wouldn't have had those problems and those expenses had he used the money for tzedakah. As the Gemara says in Masechet Baba Batra, page 10. Whereas the money that goes towards unexpected tzedakah is lost for uh, unexpected expenses, is lost forever. Money you gave to the IRS, money you gave to the doctor, money you gave for a lawsuit, money you gave for fines, money you gave for, for all types of problems, that's gone. You're never getting that money back. But the money that you would have given for tzedakah, not only would it fix your sins, Increase your blessings. But on top of it all, HaKadosh Baruch Hu promises to give you all the money back. Gemara, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 16. Gemara, Masechet Beitza, page 16 also. The money you give for the right charity, not just any charity, don't donate to some zoo. Don't feed the heretics. If you donate to the right cause, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I give you all the money back. Who did me a favor first and I will repay him, Hashem says. So now, had you given, you would have wiped out sins. You would have had more blessings and on top of it, you would have gotten all the money back and more. You didn't give. You ended up losing the blessing. You didn't lose the sins, the sins stayed, and in fact, you made even more sins by not giving. And on top of it all, the money went anyway to all types of expenses that are never coming back again. See, here the Chinuch is telling us that by not giving, you're showing, you're showing such lack of emunah in Hashem that literally you're bringing punishment on yourself. And therefore, mitzvah number 479 is the obligation of giving tzedakah, which says 478 was not to be stingy with the poor. 479 was the obligation to give. And he says we're commanded to perform acts of tzedakah with whoever needs it, with cheer and good-hearted attitude. And the smack says that if you don't give the tzedakah that you give with a positive attitude, if you're regretting that you gave, if you're unhappy that you're helping somebody, guess what? You're not even getting the mitzvah. You lost the mitzvah too. Because the mitzvah is not just giving. In fact, the Chachamim say that a person who gives charity with a sour or resentful expression loses his merit for the mitzvah, regardless of the size of his donation. This is what the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch say, and the Shach. But on the other hand, the Sefer HaIkarim says, 
that the primary reward that you will receive for giving tzedakah is for the display of a positive attitude towards the person that you gave it to, towards the recipient of the tzedakah. Now, the tzedakah that you're giving, again, sometimes it's going to be money, sometimes it's going to be encouragement, sometimes it's going to be time, sometimes it's going to be emotional support, sometimes it's going to be an act of kindness. And the Chinook says that you're, we're commanded to support a poor person with regards to anything that he needs for his livelihood in any way that we can. And the Torah says, Patoch tiftach, that you shall surely open in, in double words in order to teach us that even if the person comes twice or more, you still need to give him if you have the ability. Don't just say, oh, I gave you once already. It's enough. If you have the means, give again. Now, what's the best way of giving? Should I give directly, indirectly? The Chinuch writes, the ideal way of performing the mitzvah is to give the charity to an administrator of a tzedakah fund, to an organization that will distribute it to the recipients. Instead of giving it to the poor person, to the avrech, to the needy directly, give it to somebody, give it to an organization that will give it on your behalf. Of course, you have to make sure that the organization is actually giving the money and not taking it for themselves. Why is it better to give it that way? Says the Chinuch, because if you give it directly, the recipient will become ashamed. The recipient will become ashamed every time they see you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Why? What did I do? Oh, you remember? Yeah, you gave me money. Oh, I gave you money five years ago. Yeah, but every time he sees you, five years, he's still saying thank you. And guess what? You don't deserve that thank you. It's already too much thank you. It's already too much thank you. Thank you once. Okay, you got it. Enough. Five years you're getting a thank you. You're getting too much. It's coming from shame. Better to give it through... A tzedakah fund. And the Rambam actually writes that he's never even heard of a town, a Jewish community that does not have a tzedakah fund. And he says the ideal way of giving is that you don't know exactly who is getting and the recipient doesn't know exactly how them, you know, who gave it to them. Why? Because there's an organization in the middle. Now sometimes you have to help a wealthy person. How? A wealthy person has assets, but he does not have liquid cash. You have to give him charity. What's the charity? You have to lend him money. And this loan without interest is considered staka. Also, commands us to give charity to the poor means that we should want to do it because we want to fulfill all of the mitzvot that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us especially when we're able to be a vessel for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to bring benefit to the members of his covenant to other Jews. And if we know that a poor person needs money but doesn't want to take charity because he's too proud or he's too embarrassed, we have to employ a ruse for him. What is it? We give him money and we say it's a loan. It's a loan, no, I'm not giving you charity. I'm giving you a loan. But, says the Chinuch, we don't ask for the money back. We don't ask for the money back, we forgive him for it. But to protect his honor, we say, no, no, it's a loan, it's a loan. But we never ask for it back. But on the other hand, if there is a person that's stingy to the point where he doesn't want to dress himself appropriately, he doesn't want to live appropriately, he doesn't even want to eat appropriately, the Chinuch says, we pay him no attention whatsoever, we don't give him charity. Why? He's self-afflicting.
Now we're not obligated to make anybody rich. Meaning we have to help them with what they need. But not extra money to make them rich. Like I have sometimes people contact me and say, listen, uh, I want to get a few more suits or I want to go on vacation. Can you donate some money to me? I had a few times, I have a few people, strange people say, listen, Rabbi, I just went shopping and I depleted my, uh, my bank account, but you know, it was really nice clothes that I got and some nice shoes. Can you donate some money to me because that would be a mitzvah? Obviously I don't, but the point is people think that just because they don't have money in their bank account. That puts them in a category of being a needy. No. If you're just wasting your money, that's not being needy. That's being, that's being irresponsible. Now, the sages said in the Midrash Tanaim, a promise from the Torah, no person ever becomes poor due to the abundance of tzedakah that he gives. And in fact, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 139a says, that Am Yisrael will be redeemed only due to the merit of tzedakah that they give. Most of the details of tzedakah are in the Gemara Masechet Ketubot, and also Masechet Baba Batra. Ketubot, it's uh, 48, 49, 50, 66 to 68 and Baba Batra it's from 8 to 11 and also Da 43 the uh, mitzvah of tzedakah is both for men and women but a person must always remember that if a person does not like to give tzedakah or the moment they hear that they have to give tzedakah they immediately shriek. They, 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 they feel like it's they just uh, somebody just hit them. It's a very pro- it's a problem. According to the Chinuch, it's a sin. Now, how much should a person give? As we said, when it comes to money, the Rambam writes ten percent is normal. Really, ideally, you should give twenty. I think that if everybody gave ten percent, we'd be able to build a hundred yeshivot. But needless to say, a person should know that sometimes it's not just money. Sometimes it's skills. Sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's attention. So each person has to evaluate what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless me with? What did He give me? Because usually the people that want to give the most money don't have any money. It's like, Rabbi, if I had a million dollars, I'd give it all to you. How much do you have? I have $10.30 and I need six of it for the bus and $4 to eat. I'd give you the 30 cents though. They would. And in their mind, they would give the million dollars if they had it. In reality, it would probably be different. Why? Because they could give the million dollars when they don't have it because they don't have the test. But once a person has a million dollars, once a person has more money, usually they have a different Yetzirah. Yetzirah grows with your bank account. Yetzirah grows with your position in life. Yetzirah even grows with the amount of Torah that you have. Gemara Masechet Sukkah says, the bigger the tzaddik, bigger the chacham, the bigger is Yetzirah. It's a different Yetzirah than a person that's obviously not, but nonetheless, it's a bigger Yetzirah. Either way, a person has to evaluate what did Hashem give me? What do I have? If they have money and that's their top thing that they have, then certainly they have to make sure that they use that money to do as much good as you possibly can, not just for the sake of themselves, but also for the sake of the honor of Hashem, Torah, and Klal Yisrael. And not just for the things that give you honor and everybody says, oh wow, you're such a tzaddik, you're so nice, you're so... No. Even for the things that nobody even recognizes that you even did it. Many times people want to give 
to causes, not because they care about the cause, but rather because they're going to get some respect or some honor or recognition. Because they gave. Oh, look, they put my name. They put my name on the, uh, on the synagogue door. They put my name on the light bulb. The, the rabbi mentioned my name in his lecture. Now, yes, it's okay to get your name mentioned here and there. But if that's the reason why you're giving, it's a problem. It's a problem. Why? You're supposed to be giving for the sake of giving, for the sake of doing something good, because it's good to do something good. If you end up getting good out of it as a result also, that's okay. But if you're only giving as a result of getting recognition, that is a mum in your giving. It's a defect in your giving. Now, some people don't have money. They don't have money. But they have contacts. They're friends. They have people that they know. Use that. Use that as a way, as a vehicle to bring good to the Torah, to the honor of Hashem. Meaning, don't just have a big list of contacts on your phone just for the next uh, time that you see them at the uh, wedding or the next time you want to have a uh, get-together. No. Use those contacts in order to spread Torah. Use those contacts in order to get people to donate to a righteous cause. Hey guys, how are you? How's everything? How's the kids? How's everything? Listen, it's an amazing cause. This organization is doing great things. They're helping poor people. They're publicizing Torah. They're helping people do tshuva. They're doing great, great things. I want everybody to donate. $100, $500, $1,000 so we can help them do more. Which one of you are in? And guess what? Many of the people will donate without even checking simply because they'll trust you. And you could literally get more reward for that than even if you would have given with your own money. Because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai teaches us in the Mishnah, Gadol greater is the one that enables others to give than the one who gives himself. Meaning you get more reward for getting somebody else to give the thousand dollars taka than had you yourself given the thousand dollars. So you have a contacts, use those contacts in order to do more good in the world. Not just to have more people to say Lashonara with. Some people, they have contacts, but they only know how to use them for entertainment purposes. When it comes to Torah, it's like, oh no, I don't feel comfortable asking them to watch a shiul. I don't feel comfortable inviting them to a shiul. I don't feel comfortable asking them to, uh, to donate. Yeah, but you don't have any problems asking them if they'll go on vacation with you for $15,000. You don't have any problem asking them for a loan for this new business that you're starting. You don't have any problem calling them at 2 o'clock in the morning because you just got into a fight with your spouse you need somebody to talk to. That you don't have a problem with. But to ask them to donate a few, a few dollars or to publicize Torah, that you have a problem? That's a problem. You're not using the gift Hashem gave you and it's full potential. You're wasting your gift. Now some people don't have money. They don't have contacts. But they have a skill. Everybody has a skill. Your profession. You are a nurse. You're a doctor. You're a lawyer. You're an accountant. You're a developer. Computer developer. Very valuable skill these days. You are a, a graphics artist. You are a person that uh, delivers stuff, whatever it is. Find a way to use that skill to help the world of Torah. Find a way. There's a doctor in Eretz Yisrael. He's a uh, dentist. He is probably one of the biggest, most righteous dentists on planet Earth. How do I know? Because he has a normal operation, takes care of people, has employees, charges normal prices, 
Unless you're an avrich. If you're an avrich, you're not allowed to pay. Even if the avrich has money. Even if the avrich wants to pay. He says, no, no, no. You learn Torah. That's what you do. You're not allowed to pay here. Your money's not good here. Your money's not good. Why? You learn Torah. Here is free. And he takes care of avrichim. He takes care of avrichim. He uses his skill in order to help the world of Torah. Now, sometimes a person doesn't have such a skill like that or a developer, but they have time. So they'll use that time. You know what? I have an hour a day, two hours a day, three hours a day. I can use that time to go give out some of Rabbi Reuven's books, some of the USBs. I'm on the internet already. I'm on Facebook, YouTube, all these different social medias. I'm going to share the lectures all over the place. Start groups. Start WhatsApp groups. Start Telegram groups. Start, I don't know, whatever groups. To spread more Torah. To raise more money. To do more good. So they use the skill. They use the talent. They use the time. And guess what? You can tell who wants to go to heaven and who doesn't. Simply by their way of giving. The Chachamim teach us, a person does not know how much time he has in this world. But if they knew how much a mitzvah is worth, they'd literally grab him and grab him as fast as possible without letting anything go in their way. Without letting anything in their way. They'd literally grab as much as they possibly can. So there are some people that they may have money or they may have contacts or they may have time or they may have skills or they have some type of resources but they don't realize the value of a mitzvah so they don't use those resources they waste them and there are some people that they don't have much resources but whatever resource they have they maximize that resource to its full potential And you see these people literally fighting tooth and nail to gather mitzvot. Whatever they can. I have five minutes in between shifts. I'm going to share some lectures. I'm going to share some messages for people to watch lectures, for people to donate, for people to do something good. People waste their time sharing jokes, sharing uh, memes, sharing nonsense. He's sharing Torah. She's sharing Torah. Every five minutes they get a chance. Oh, I got a break over here for two hours. Instead of just sitting on a couch, staring at the ceiling. Let me go give out some books, some USBs. Let me try to call some people, arrange a lecture, arrange a shield Torah. Let me do something. Now when a person realizes the value of a mitzvah, they take any opportunity that they can without allowing anything get in their way. So the question is how much is too much? How much is too much? That all depends of how much knowledge we have of the value of our mitzvot. The more knowledge a person has of the value of mitzvot and the obligation they have to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the more they're going to utilize every bit of their effort to push through especially when it's difficult, especially when they don't want to. Because if they could overcome, if they could overcome those times where it's difficult, where they don't feel like it, where it's expensive, where it's, you know, all types of different issues of why it's tough to do it, if they could overcome those times, they could literally reprogram their neshama to become addicted to mitzvot, where nothing will get in their way. Where literally, they'll start becoming a radar for mitzvot. Where people will ask you, how come you're giving? In your mind, you're saying, why wouldn't I? In their mind, they're like, why are you doing it? But you've programmed your mind already to the point of, why are you asking such a question? Why wouldn't I give? Meaning, the 
variance between the two is as if you're two different species. You have programmed yourself to give, to do good. Not because people are grateful. The opposite. People are not grateful. And you're not even expecting them to be grateful. But you're not giving because people are grateful. You're giving for the sake of giving. Because it's good to do good. Because the more a person programs themselves to give for the sake of heaven, for the sake of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for the sake of publicizing His glorious name in His Torah, the more a person is becoming godly. The more a person refrains from giving, the more a person only gives on condition of getting something in return, the more they become like a donkey that's material, that is physical, that is dust and ashes at some point. You see, Rabotai Karim, in order to get to a point where you desire to give, you have to overcome the times. You have to overcome the obstacles. So how much is too much? It depends where you want your destination to be. If you're living for this world, then quite frankly, everything is too much. But if you're using this world to build yourself an eternal world of good, to build yourself an eternal connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that's good, to build yourself as a servant and a vessel that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will use in this world, there is no limitation. Why? Because if He gave you the opportunity to do it, then certainly He knows you can do it. And if you can't, you'll also find that out too. But you'll still get a reward for trying. That's the amazing reward system that Hashem has. You don't have to succeed in publicizing Torah, in giving a lot of money, in in, in anything, in order for Hashem to reward you for it. You just have to try your hardest. And He knows exactly just how much is your hardest because He's the one that gave you the ability to do it. So if a person wants to be like the great tzaddikim we read about, like the great tzaddikot we read about, like the Rav Kanievsky or his wife, Batsheva Kanievsky, the great extraordinary tzaddika, the Rabbanit Kanievsky, or any of the righteous people that Ami has had throughout history, you can do it. And it all starts with utilizing the gifts that Hashem already gave you to the best of your potential, to the best of their potential, but also most importantly, making sure that your understanding of giving is the right one. Giving for the sake of Hashem is really receiving from Hashem. With that being said, I hope that everybody understands who and what they're giving and why. And Bezal Hashem, each person will apply accordingly to whatever it is that's important to them. Okay, you guys can start asking some questions. Bezal Hashem, Kadosh Baruch will help us to answer. Okay, the uh, TikTok, there's too many comments. I can't just ask the questions again if you ask the question. Uh, we'll go to YouTube now. If an administrator is reading this, I'm speaking the truth. I want to donate my entire property to Bezal Hashem Inc. I'm located in Mexico. Um, thank you very much. I don't know what I would do with a property in Mexico other than sell it, but uh, by all means, if you'd like to donate, you could contact us and we'll try to figure out what to do. But uh, certainly, you don't need to donate everything you have. 
like we discussed in this year today. If my, if one doesn't have money to give, can they give? Can you do good deeds instead? Yeah, that's what we explained. You could use your time, your skills, uh, your efforts. There's plenty of ways to do good. There's plenty of gifts that Hashem gave a person aside from money. For those of you that are asking specific about verses, just look at the commentary by Rashi on every verse in the Torah, and you'll see exactly what the verse means, who it's speaking about, who is speaking. Commentary by the legendary sage Rashi that lived in France 900 years ago. I'm ignoring a lot of questions that I already answered in the past, such as what do I think about Muslims or Christians and all that other stuff, because I've answered these questions before already. In the last lecture, you talked very strongly about keeping connected to the source and to a tzaddik rabbi. Besides listening to a lecture, can we be assured, how can we be assured that we are connected? Um, so if a person um, watched my lectures from the Pirkei Avot series, there were several Mishnayot in Pirkei Avot that uh, talked about having a rabbi. And I've had this uh, topic discussed in different ways several times over the years. Uh, first off, I would highly recommend a person uh, watch every lecture that I've made about having a rabbi uh, and, and the topic in general, because the more a person understands what having a rabbi is, uh, and the, the more they'll know how to be connected to the source, how to be a, a, a good student, how to be a, a good Jew, how to be a good human. Uh, because the ultimate uh, and most critical thing of, of a student is to know that they have a superior that they have to answer to, that's in this world. We're not just talking about God. We're talking about their rabbi. What does that mean? That means that if a person is going to have a rabbi, that means they're going to ask that rabbi, and they're going to learn that from that rabbi. They're going to do whatever they can do in order to stay connected to that rabbi. And it's, it's important for a person to do whatever they can. Now, if they are local to their rabbi, of course, pray with the rabbi, uh, go to the rabbi's lectures, support the rabbi, whatever they can do to stay connected uh, to the rabbi. If the rabbi needs a ride to, uh, to the store, if the rabbi needs any help, you know, it's called shimush, to try to help their rabbi in any way. Now, if their, uh, their rabbi is not local, like for example, my rabbi is in Israel, I'm in America. For more than, uh, you know, 10, 12, 13 years, 14 years that we've been learning together, Baruch Hashem, the overwhelming majority of the time, uh, where, you know, we, we don't see each other. We see each other on a screen. Uh, but needless to say, uh, I'm in communications with them, Baruch Hashem, almost every day in some form or another, uh, whether it's learning together or asking a question uh, or guidance, all types of things, whatever way. Uh, necessary, I'm constantly connected to him. I speak more to him than, uh, than anybody else in the world. Um, and he, Bo Hashem, you know, has dedicated a lot of time to, to learn with me over the years. Obviously, there were times that we're able to learn a lot more than uh, we're able to do at other times for different uh, reasons, life changes and circumstances of life. But the point being is, is throughout all of the years, I made sure to do the best that I can to stay connected, to learn every lecture that he had. If I uh, missed it, I you know, make sure to watch it after, uh, to, to take every lecture seriously, to, to write notes, to make sure that I absorb as much uh, information as I possibly can uh, because it's a priority in my life. Secondly, you know, when, it came, when it comes down to, uh, to any types of issues, even if I know the answer, many times I will double check. I will double check to make sure that what I believe is the answer is, uh, you know, I double check that it's correct. Now it's a, uh, and this, this is obviously I'm not going to ask things that I could quickly find out 
just by uh, just by uh, opening a, a you know a book uh, that's you know readily available to me, like you know, uh, or, or or my application on the phone. Like, what time does uh, you know Shabbat start? I'm not going to ask questions like that, but you know, halachic questions, ideological questions, uh, business questions, family questions, children questions, things of that nature. Even if I believe that I know the answer, many times I will double check to see if I'm thinking right by telling him this is the issue, this is what I think, am I right or am I wrong? You know, I don't test him. You know, I don't do what many people try to uh, to do with rabbis, which is, you know, they got an answer uh, from some source, either from a different rabbi or from a book, but they ask the question without telling the rabbi that they know it already. They want to test the rabbi to see if they get the same answer. This is an unethical way of asking a question. It's not allowed to do such a thing. It's considered a sin. Uh, but the point being is, is that I ask a question. If I know the answer, I tell him this is what I think the answer is. And if I'm right, he tells me I'm right. If I'm wrong, he tells me I'm wrong. If uh, I'm in the right direction, wrong direction, whatever it is. So I constantly uh, use him as guidance. Number three, a submit. What does that mean, submit? Submissiveness is the ultimate... Uh, necessity in order to grow in the world of Torah. And this is one of the most difficult things for people to do because people believe that they're much better than what they really are. So they're not willing to submit. Uh, so they're not willing to simply say whatever the rabbi says, by default, it's right. By default, it's right. Even if I don't understand it, the flaw is in me. The missing link is in me. This doesn't mean that you're not allowed to ask questions. It just means that once the rabbi says something and it says this is final, then that's it. It's final. If he says you have to go, you go. You have to stay, you stay. You have to learn, you learn. You have to give, you give. Whatever it is that you have to, if he says something, then this is what you have to do. And the problem is with most people is that they're willing to submit to a certain point. To a certain point. They're willing to submit if you tell them to wear something, uh, give something, do something, accept, you know, some red line that they have. And that's the difference between being righteous and being pretty much wherever you are. And that's the difference with a lot of people, that they're not willing to submit. This was also the secret to the success of Moshe Rabbeinu. The reason why he's called the, the humblest man that ever lived was because he submitted. He, sub, he was submissive to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and, and, and not just uh, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the greatest and, and the Almighty, but well, well before he even spoke to him. Well before he ever spoke to Hashem, well before the, all of the things that we read about in the Chumash ever happened, he already submitted, he already worked on himself and perfected himself for many, many years before all of this happened. And the key for a person to know is that when you submit to what's called da Torah, the opinion of the Torah, that means that you already admit that you don't know everything, that there's going to be a deciding factor that is not going to agree with you many times. But you're still going to do it because you're submissive, because you're submitting to the Torah. So that's another factor that's very, very critical. Uh, the, uh, of course, when people ask me, can I, you know, can you be my rabbi? And I always tell people, me being your rabbi or not being your rabbi is not really dependent on me. It's more dependent on the person than it is on the rabbi itself. Why? Because for you to make somebody your rabbi, that means that you have to make them your da Torah. You have to make sure that all of the, you know, the studying of Torah uh, that you're going to get, the, the the primary source of all of your Torah is going to be that. It's going to be that. You're going to learn, you're not going to learn from 10 different rabbis or three different rabbis or five different rabbis. You're going to make that rabbi your number one, number two, number three. That's your priority. And unfortunately, many times people like to shop around. They like to listen to three, four, five different rabbis and not realize that many times when you listen to many different types of rabbis without making one priority number one over everything else. Not that you like somebody more than everybody else. You make one rabbi, that's your priority. Where pretty much you're not even going to delve into anything else unless you've caught up on every single Torah teaching that that rabbi has, uh, which is usually not possible if, if it's, a, you know, it's an active Talmud Chacham, it's an active rabbi. And many times people delve into a lot of different rabbis and they end up knowing a little bit about many different topics, but 
unfortunately, they're not complete about anything, and they end up having a lot of confusion. Or, worse yet, what I've seen happen uh, over the years is that people learn Torah, they made some changes in their life, but for whatever reason or another, at some point or another, they decide to stop. Where they say, listen, I know enough, I'm a kosher person, I eat kosher, I dress kosher, uh, I don't kill anybody. And they simply think that they could just be on neutral from now on. Neutral doesn't exist. In Judaism, the sages have taught us endless amount of times. If you're not rising in the world of Torah, you're, you're going down. There is no such thing as neutral. So if you're not learning from the rabbi, you should know that you are slowly but surely getting further and further away from the rabbi. And that's why several times we have had issues with different people that were my, uh, called themselves my Talmidim. I already knew when this, uh, this, uh, th- these people were actually learning my shurim or not. I already knew. I don't need to see you attend lectures or see your profile name on the internet to know whether you are watching my lectures or not. Uh, and they, uh, just so you know, that the few things that you could know is, number one, if they're asking questions. The more people ask you questions that are relevant to the lectures you gave, the more you know if they're actually watching your lectures. But if they're asking you random questions, that's in itself a proof that usually they're not watching your lectures, they're just using you for questions. Second thing is, the more they accept what you're saying, the more they are connected to you and the more they're watching your lectures and learning from you. The more they become, uh, um, they reject what you're saying, the more disconnected they are. And that's why it's several times that I've had over the years where people have told me that uh, they uh, stopped watching the lectures. I always predicted time and time again, Baruch Hashem, it didn't happen so many times, but unfortunately, the handful or so uh, of times that it's happened, it's always been painful. I predicted it, and I told the people that it's only a matter of time before not only uh, I will no longer be this rabbi that you think is so great, and is amazing and transformed your life and so on, but I will eventually, you will make me your enemy without me doing anything. Anything different uh, than what I did to help you. Anything different than what I did to guide you. Anything different than what I did to teach you. I will not change, but in your mind I will. Ultimately, I will become your enemy. Why? Because when the Yetzirah sees that you're connected to a source that is helping you do tshuva, that is helping you get closer to Hashem, that is helping you serve Hashem, that is helping you become better, the ultimate thing that the Yetzirah wants to do is to disconnect. Disconnect you from the source. As the Gemara, Maseret Kiddushim, and Maseret Brachot, and several other places says, HaKadosh Baruch says, I created the Yetzirah, I created the Torah as the potion. So what does the Yetzirah want to do? Yetzirah wants to disconnect you from the potion, make you drop the bottle and break it. So he's not going to tell you, listen, go and uh, eat pig. What he's going to tell you, first, disconnect from the source. Stop listening to two, three, four, five lectures a week because they're not new. So only listen to the new ones. And if there's only one or two new ones a week, only listen to one or two, even though you have seven days a week, even though you can listen to at least three, four, five, six, seven day, uh, lectures a week. No, only listen to the whatever is new. So that's mistake number one. Mistake number two, even when the new ones come out, you're like, ah, oh, listen, I'm busy, I got this, I got that, you listen to them less and less often. And before you know it, you all of a sudden say, you know what, I watched it, but it didn't really move me. It didn't really, uh, I didn't feel like I was connected because it was, uh, it was too much uh, punishment. It was too much uh, fluffy, too much reward, too much uh, stories, too much alacha. Too much this, or it was uh, it wasn't live, or it wasn't uh, face to face. It was only on the internet, or uh, it was combined. All types of mumbo jumbo excuses that the Yetzirah is going to use exactly what he needs in order to convince you stop watching. Now he's not telling you stop watching because you're going to become this rabbi's enemy. No, Chas Shalom. No, this rabbi changed your life. This rabbi is like your father. This rabbi. He's like uh, Moshe Rabbeinu for you. He's like, uh, he's, the, he's the best. Don't ever say anything bad about this rabbi. Never. 
But he's going to get you disconnected. And little by little, you watch less. And little by little, you start disagreeing. You ask a question. The rabbi said, A. You're like, let me ask another rabbi. Let me look at uh, this. Let me look at that. And all of a sudden, you find yourself that you are agreeing less and less with the rabbi. And then one day, the rabbi tells you, by the way, you're doing something wrong. And you're like, oh, why is the rabbi telling me I'm doing something wrong? How could he talk to me that way? Wait a minute. Did you forget? That you used to beg the rabbi, please, rabbi, please, give me Musar. Help me become a tzaddik. Help me become a tzaddikah, please. Anything you can do to guide me. Did you forget that? You used to beg the rabbi to help you, and now all of a sudden, when the rabbi finally told you to do something, and you're rejecting it, you don't realize? No. Unfortunately, most people don't. And what ends up happening is that the people end up breaking the most valuable relationship they have in their life, more valuable than even a person has to their flesh and blood parents. Because just as the Gemara says that your parents gave you this world, the same Gemara says the rabbi, that you make your rabbi, that rabbi gave you the next world. And therefore, if both were hostages, you have to free the rabbi first. If both lost their wallet, you have to find the rabbis first. So unfortunately, what people don't realize about having a rabbi is the amount of commitment that it requires. It's not just watching the lectures. It's immersing yourself to do whatever is possible to support the rabbi, learn from the rabbi, connect to the rabbi, whatever it is. And again, that doesn't mean that the rabbi is going to be available to you and only you. You know how many people had uh, made Rabbi Vadya their rabbi? What do you think? Rabbi made, uh, Rabbi Vadya made a meeting with every one of them every time they had a question? No. You want questions? Come to the shul. You're learning the shul. Read the books. Yeah, but what if I have a private question? Send a letter or come stand online for three, four, five hours whenever the rabbi had time to see people. And uh, ask the question for a couple of minutes. But people have this deluded idea that uh, if you're my rabbi, then I have free access to you whenever I want. And unfortunately, they abuse the system. They abuse the system. They, they, uh, they ask for all types of things without doing anything for it. Oh, rabbi, listen, can you uh, a, uh, do a shiur for my, uh, for my family? Come to my house and do a shiur for my family? We're having a, uh, you know, we're having a get together, and it's uh, one of my cousins is over from uh, from this. We're gonna, okay, you, are you gonna have hundred people, two hundred people there? No, no, it's just you know, it's just some of us, 20, 30 people. Uh, okay, well, the rabbi comes. Rabbi comes, gives a shield Torah. They put some, you know, some sandwiches. They put some food. All right, the guy, the rabbi came, gave a lecture. Ah, chazaku baruch, rabbi, and the rabbi goes home. And guess what? They don't give him any money. They don't give him any, any help. They just figure, listen, he's a rabbi. So he wants to teach. So we're going to use him to teach. Wrong. Wrong. You have to support the rabbi. You have to give him money. You have to give him money. Not because he asked. The opposite. Because he didn't ask, you give him money. But that's the problem. People don't realize this. They don't do two and two. They figure that if, you know, the lawyer is worth $500 or $1,000 an hour. The doctor is worth $1,000 an hour. The uh, developer is worth $1,000 an hour. But the rabbi? No, the rabbi is free. The rabbi is free. And they disrespect the rabbi's times, they disrespect the rabbi's knowledge, and unfortunately, little by little, they destroy their own lives. So again, the commitment to make a rabbi is a all-encompassing commitment where you, in essence... No, this is a place to learn from. This is a place to get guidance from. This is my Da'at Torah. If a person is willing to do that, and certainly whoever they choose to be their rabbi can, uh, can be their rabbi. But so long as a person values their own opinion uh, more than the rabbis, then unfortunately that, that you're never going to have a rabbi. 
uh, this this is a uh, this is uh, unfortunately the biggest problem uh, that's uh, in 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 the world uh, of Torah today that people do not realize what a rabbi actually is. They don't value rabbis, uh, especially once they leave yeshiva. Uh, especially once they leave yeshiva. Now, uh, let me see. Next question. Jesus will save you? No. Jesus couldn't save himself. He was hung on some cross like, uh, like a fish. Gets, uh, hung. How, how could he, he couldn't save himself. How is he going to save anybody? Torah says that believing in Jesus, in the New Testament, is a form of idol worship. Why? Because the New Testament is a man-made false document that divides God into three, that says that God became a human being. Uh, so the, the whole concept of a, uh, uh, Jesus is a form of idolatry. And uh, the more a person learns actual Torah, the more they'll realize that uh, believing in Jesus and being uh, righteous with Hashem is impossible is impossible because the Torah itself talks about how God is not a man that would change his mind. Uh, you know, he has no body or the, or the likeness of the body, uh, you know, and all types of, uh, he is one and all types of things that are uh, the contradict the foundation of the New Testament. Uh, so it's not, it's not possible to be righteous with God, the God of the Torah, the God of Am Yisrael and believe in the New Testament. Now, as far as the uh, uh, needing somebody to save you, you don't need anybody to save you. Your actions are going to determine whether you're righteous with God or not. And God specifically has told us in the Torah multiple times that uh, you do not need a middleman to, to serve him. You, uh, you, you, know, you serve him by following the mitzvot and the Torah. The rabbis, the sages, they're not middlemen. They're simply interpreting to you what God said because they dedicated their life to learning the Torah and therefore they understand the Torah much more than you do. Just like if you go and get a, uh, a, uh, you know, an x-ray uh, uh, for, for parts of your body, although you have eyes, although you have a brain, if you look at the x-ray without the expertise of a radiologist, you are not going to know what you're looking at. You're going to look at a picture and you're going to think it's your head, but in reality, it could be your finger. It could be your toe. It could be some completely different body part. It could be a tooth uh, because you're not a radiologist. You have no concept of how to read uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the x-ray. And the same thing with all types of other medicine. Unless you have the expertise in the field, you cannot expect yourself to have uh, similar understanding of what you're looking at. And the same thing with the Torah. People that come into the world of Torah, you know, you know over a couple of years, yet expect themselves to have a, uh, uh, you know, information that's superior to Torah scholars that have dedicated decades upon decades of their life to the Torah, is simply stupid, arrogant, and, uh, and just simply crazy. Uh, but unfortunately, it happens. So if a person understands that the Torah specifically tells us that in order for us to serve God, we have to follow the Torah, there is no other way, uh, that person will never even look at the New Testament. 
Uh, but unfortunately, most people that believe in the New Testament are not uh, knowledgeable about the Torah. Uh, they, they call the, the, the Torah the Old Testament as if it's old and not relevant anymore. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, they, they don't really know what it says, they, aside from a few pointers here and there that they heard somebody say. Uh, but if you actually read the Torah uh, you know, with the commentary of the sages... Uh, of the Jewish sages, you'll see that literally within the first several pages, you will realize that Christianity is false. Several pages after that, you'll realize that it's not only false, it is literally an intentional man-made lie uh, in order to manipulate people. And the more you learn Torah, the more you'll realize that there is no other truth other than the Torah. Uh, I have several lectures about the topic. You could also go to my uh, website, bezatashem.org. There's uh, a section about it as well, of showing the different falsehoods about the New Testament. And you could see how uh, you could uh, go in the righteous path, but that means you also have to abandon the falsehood first. What is the most important thing to keep in mind during Pesach? Uh, now, many people spend all of their energy... Uh, and their excitement preparing for Pesach. They're cleaning, they're preparing food, they're uh, you know, learning the different uh, details of the mitzvot, and that's all good. The problem is that if you arrive to Pesach tired, both mentally, physically, exhausted, in a bad mood, then you ruin the holiday. It was better for you to prepare less in order to be in a better mood than to do all of this preparation and you arrive at Pesach completely spent and, and with a nasty attitude. So the first thing that a person needs to know as far as the uh, 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 preparation for Pesach or to have in mind in Pesach is to have a good, happy attitude. Good, happy attitude is kasher le Pesach. Bad attitude, nasty attitude... Horrible attitude, chametz. It's chametz. Chametz, chametz, chametz. And you have to burn that chametz. So that's number one. Number two, Pesach is an opportunity for you to connect with Hashem, which means you should utilize part of the time, of course, you're going to use it to do the mitzvot of Pesach. To eat seder, eat the matzah, but also part of the time is going to be to learn Torah. Learn Torah. Don't just eat, drink, sleep. Also, learn Torah. Another part of the time, spend some time with the family. Spend a little bit of time with the family. You know, with the, your, your, your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your children. It depends what age you are, whatever it is. It's a time to spend with the family. Definitely do not work during the holiday. Don't work during the holiday. Unless you are in a, uh, you know, you're, you're a rabbi, you're a chazan, you're a uh, bal kore, you're, you have some type, you're a dayan. Uh, unless you are in the world of Torah, uh, no work on Pesach. Uh, it's uh, make sure that uh, not, not during Yom Tov and certainly not during Chol HaMoed. Anyone that uh, works to make money uh, during Chol HaMoed can be assured that whatever money they make will not have a blessing. In fact, uh, you're not allowed to work on Chol HaMoed, uh, even though you're allowed to drive, you're allowed to cook on Chol HaMoed, uh, you're allowed to do Melachot on Chol HaMoed, but you're not allowed to work on Chol HaMoed unless not working will cause a loss. And I always have to remind people that a loss doesn't mean a missed profit. Meaning if you work and make money, and if you don't work, you don't make money, that's not considered a loss. That just means it's a, you just, it's a loss of an opportunity, but it's not a, a financial loss. A loss would mean that if you work, you make money. If you don't work, you'll lose money because let's say you'll get fired or, or, or you'll lose a contract of some kind or something like that. That's considered a loss. That's considered a loss. So unless there's going to be a loss, you're not even allowed to consider working. And even when it comes to a, uh, a loss, not everything that people define as a loss is always a loss. Uh, sometimes a person needs to know that uh, you know, delaying 
uh, a, a deadline or perhaps working a little harder to, uh, to, to make up for the uh, less days of work is uh, better to do than to work during the holiday. Why? Because if you work during the holiday, you could be sure that whatever money you make during the holiday, you're not going to have any blessing from it. Uh, the other thing is also, if you look at the Gemara in Maseret Moed Katan, says that anyone that works during the holiday, Jews that work during the, uh, uh, the Chola Moed, when they don't have to work, lose their Olam back. Meaning it's not, not a big deal. It's a very, very big deal. Jews that work during Chola Moed, when they don't have to work, they lose their share in the world to come. It's a big, big deal. So a person needs to take all of this into consideration. So we have attitude, we have no work, we have the proper use of time to learn Torah, to spend with the family, uh, th- those, those, uh, those few things. Uh, and uh, ultimately, it's, a, uh, it's just make sure that you don't forget to be very, very grateful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, of course, every day, but especially during the holidays, because it's the holidays that are the biggest reminders of the benefits of being a Jew. More than anything else, more than any other time during the year, a person is reminded of the benefits of being a Jew. It's usually during the holidays, even though we should be reminded of the benefits every single day. And of course, needless to say, on Shabbat, the holidays are usually the greatest reminders of the benefits of being a Jew. So, which means that when you are doing the Lela Sedel, you know, and, and you're, you're talking about Avadim Ainu, that we were slaves in Egypt, you have to actually, the, the Shuchan Aruch says, you actually have to think at that moment that you actually were a slave. You were a slave. The Egyptians were whipping you, beating you up, killing children, torturing people, using them as as uh, holders for light bulbs, using them as, uh, you know, all types of uh, food for animals, using them for horrible things. You were one of those people. And you couldn't do anything about it. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu ishtabach shimo la'ad. HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself came, destroyed Egypt in a series of plagues, and not only freed you, but made you the most extraordinary part of the world. Made you part of his people. So you went from being a slave, a lowly, filthy, smelly, abused slave with no choice, with no opinion, with no nothing, to being a Kadosh Baruch Hu's servant, to be free from being a slave of man and to have the privilege of being the servant of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You have to think. Yesterday, I was a slave. Yesterday, they could have taken the kids and killed them. They could have taken my arms and chopped them off. They could have taken me and turned me into a light bulb holder. They could have taken me and threw me to the alligators. Could have done all types of things. But today, they can't touch me. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu protects me. HaKadosh Baruch Hu took me out of Egypt. And he destroyed them. And he gave me the Torah. And he gave me an instruction set to assure myself that he will continue protecting me. person that really thinks about this they're bound to be happy. The key is to think about this as often as possible, especially during the holiday. Pesach is a time where a person has to really think of all the amazing things that we say every day. We say, Baruch Shalom Asani Goy, thank you for not making me a Goy. Why? Because if I was a Goy, I wouldn't have the miracles that you made for me at Mount Sinai, in Egypt at uh, uh, giving me the Torah, giving me the uh, ability to, uh, to have family purity, Brit Milah, Tfilin, Tzitzit, Talit, learning Gemara, 
learning, uh, you know, Chobot and Levavot, learning Shuchan Aruch, having a, a ra- all these amazing things. I wouldn't have them. I wouldn't have them if I wasn't Jewish. So thank you, Hashem, for making me Jewish. Thank you for giving me a mitzvah to be modest. Thank you for giving me a mitzvah to have, uh, you know, proper morality. Thank you. Why? Because that in itself distinguishes me from everything else in the world. From everything else in the world. And the more a person realizes it, the more they're going to appreciate it, the more they're going to value uh, and, and celebrate the fact that they're Jewish. During the holiday, it's certainly a time for a person to take time and, and, and say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Thank you, thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Now I know that everybody is going to arrive at the holiday exhausted, spent, starving, uh, this and that. Don't make your whole holiday only about food. Don't make your whole holiday only about food. Many people make the whole holiday about food and then uh, going to uh, on vacation or going to some park. Don't make your whole holiday just about going to a park and about food. There's more to a Jewish holiday than food and going to a park. There's more to it. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's good for a person to utilize as much, as, they pos- as much time as possible to learn Torah and, and to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Of course, again, you have to spend some time with family, with kids, spouse, and so on. But it's not just that. It's not just that. There's, there's more. And, uh, and most critical, positive attitude. Good attitude, happy attitude, no fighting, no arguing, be a mevater. You know, it's, it's just simply a, uh, a better way to celebrate and certainly a better way to, to, to live. YouTube is full of uh, terrorists today. I don't understand why. Uh, why you guys come to the channel? I don't get it. If a Kohen marries a convert, is he still a Kohen? No. If a Kohen marries a convert, he loses his kehuna. He is now called a halal. Halal means that he is not uh, uh, considered a uh, Kohen anymore. He's not allowed to uh, practice the mitzvot of the kehuna, whether it's at the Bet HaMikdash or giving Birkat Kohanim. Uh, his children would not be considered uh, Kohanim uh, and uh, and the reality is also is that uh, he's usually not going to have a uh, um, uh, an orthodox rabbi marry him, uh, so, you know, unless he fools the rabbi. No normal orthodox rabbi will uh, marry a kohen with a convert. Uh, and and generally speaking, a person needs to know that if they're going against the Torah. They, they will get compensated accordingly for it. You know, meaning that if a person knows that they're not allowed to do something, such as they are a Kohen or, you know, and they want to marry a convert, and they know they're not allowed to marry a convert, but they decide to marry the convert anyway, they should know that that decision is going to be the worst decision of their life. Much worse than had they uh, overcome the difficulty and the pain of leaving this person or not marrying this person. Why? Because life is not what people make it to be. You know, people think that, oh, you know, the way I feel today, the way uh, my financials are today, the way life is today, that's the way it's going to be. People are, don't realize uh, how a Kadosh Baruch can change everything in a second. I can give you an example, actually, that's very relevant to the, uh, you know, shiur that we gave today, without giving a name. 
there was a uh, person that was uh, in charge of a huge organization uh, where they were ra- he raised a lot of money, literally tens and tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, usually under the, uh, the 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 cause of feeding the poor, he had a uh, a place where uh, people would come to eat for free every day. But he uh, raised a lot of money. People, you know, uh, like to help feed the poor, so people donate a lot of money uh, to him, uh, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, and um, he actually came to. Uh, Arav uh, Gidon ben Moshe, and uh, one time, and Arav uh, Gidon ben Moshe, you know, he asked him what, ask him a question about uh, this building that uh, or this whole facility that he wanted to uh, build, uh, and uh, issues of purity and impurity, all types of different details. And the facility was, you know, something that uh, cost tens of millions of dollars. And he says, "Listen, I have the money for it, and uh, I saved it over this time. And uh, but I'm thinking about when I'm going to make the move." And uh, to his surprise, Rav Gidon Ben Moshe told him, uh, "The truth is that you are not allowed to save all this money. You are not allowed to save all this money. You know, people gave you uh, money to feed the poor, uh, and uh, you fed the poor, but not with the." complete amount of money why because you thought listen i'm gonna feed the poor but i'm also gonna save you know a few million here a few million there if you for why because you wanted to do something big you want to build a facility and do this and do that so you uh said i'm gonna save all this money and uh you know even though that means i'm gonna feed less people I'm going to eventually going to do something that's going to compensate for it. So Rav Gidon said, according to Allah, you violated the Torah with saving this money. You violated the Torah by saving this money. Because even though you meant to do well, even though you mean well, in reality is you aren't supposed to save the money. You aren't supposed to save the money. So this was not even a question that he came for. But he was very surprised. Anyway, he was looking to build this facility and he, uh, he had buildings and all types of things and he uh, one day wakes up to terrible news where apparently he's become the center of attention for some, uh, some people that uh, apparently decided to destroy him and literally within a uh, matter of, I think it was a matter of a few days or a matter of a few months, uh, he literally got... The worst news of his life. What? All of his assets were taken away from him. They were originally frozen. And then, you know, eventually there would be a whole series, I think like 10 years of of court cases, uh, trying to explain himself, trying to do this, trying to do that. Long story short, he saw in his life that uh, Arav Gidon was right, that uh, he wasn't supposed to save the money. And because he, instead of using the money that people donated in order for him to do a mitzvah with it, he uh, delayed the mitzvah because he wanted to do, according to him, a bigger mitzvah. Uh, He actually got punished for it and he ended up losing all the money. Uh, So many times people say, listen, I'm going to, uh, you know, save this money until I'm able to make a bigger donation. You're not allowed. When you're, you're supposed to make a mitzvah, as soon as it comes to your door, as soon as it comes to your door, you have a poor person in front of you now, you have an opportunity to help somebody uh, uh, now, you have an opportunity to help the Torah, to help somebody poor, whatever it is. You have an opportunity now, you have to do the mitzvah now. Yeah, but I only want to do it if I have a lot more. Who says you're going to live that far? Who says that's what Hashem wants? And that's what a lot of people don't realize is that it's a the timing uh, of the Torah is not necessarily always in agreement with uh, with, with people. Uh, so it, it's important for a person to know what Da'at Torah is. What is the opinion of the Torah? What is the uh, uh, what does the Torah tell us uh, what to do? Where you know whether it's right or left. Now, when it comes to uh, one second, I see this.
when it comes to uh, when it comes to mitzvot, a person has to do whatever they can to uh, fulfill the mitzvot that are in front of them right there and then, and not try to uh, pick and choose, not try to uh, uh, you know uh, think that they are running the world. They should do what Hashem says as soon as possible, and Bezot uh, Hashem they'll have uh, the blessing. Where can I donate? You could donate uh, on a few places. You could donate uh, if you're uh, you're on uh, YouTube. So you could donate on the uh, website bezatashem.org. You could donate on our phone app, uh, which is also called bezatashem. You could donate on the website bhtorah.org. You could donate on if you want to help the poor for Pesach. You could donate on bhpesach.org. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you could donate on via Facebook. You could also subscribe as a paid subscriber on uh, YouTube. Uh, you could also send a check. You could send a wire. There are plenty of ways to uh, to donate. Doesn't giving tzedakah to family come first? Uh, only if they are uh, needy, meaning only if they don't have any other way. But if they have money... Uh, and they're not poor, then no, it's not, it's not considered staka. Depends. Uh, is it allowed to save money? Uh, yes, you're allowed to save money as long as, again, you're uh, also fulfilling your obligations of helping people that are needy. As long as you're helping people that are in need. But if, you're, if, if your savings are uh, to the point where you're not uh, fulfilling your responsibility of helping those that are in need, um, then, uh, then no, it's not, you're, you're not following the Torah. Is a single woman obligated to go to the mikveh? No, a single woman is not allowed to go to the mikveh. Only married women go to the mikveh. Married Jewish women. What do you do when you help somebody voluntarily and then this person reminds you not to forget to send them the tzedakah? It makes me feel like it's a charge. Is that right? No, not at all. If somebody helped you, uh, then uh, you should certainly be uh, uh, grateful. And if the person tells you that, uh, reminds you to give them tzedakah, uh, then uh, that's only because you put yourself in that position, not because they necessarily did it, because had you fulfilled uh, your obligation of helping those that are in need the right way, they would never be in a position to need to ask you. You would have already help them before they asked you. If this person asks for tzedakah, and I know that is a person who is an idolater, should I send tzedakah? No, you should not give tzedakah to an idol worshiper. No. Um, food you can give them, but to give them money, no. Does Hashem have a sense of humor? What does the Torah say about laughter? Uh, well, there's, it depends. It depends what a person is laughing about. The Gemara actually gives a story that one of the sages uh, saw that there was a uh, couple of people that uh, Eliyahu Navi told them these two people have uh, a share in the world to come. And he said, what do they do? He said, they're, uh, they're comedians. Uh, comedians, comedians usually are uh, not necessarily the most righteous. No, no, they uh, specifically used, you know, kosher jokes, and they made the uh, you know the poor and the destitute 
uh, laugh in order to cheer them up and get them out of their uh, depression. So they were doing a righteous thing. Uh, so laughter is certainly a, a good thing, but again, there's a there's a uh, uh, a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Uh, just like there's a uh, your there are certain things that uh, you're allowed to do, there's certain things that you're forbidden to do, there's certain things that are sometimes allowed and sometimes forbidden. It depends what it is. As far as does God have a sense of humor? You know, God doesn't have senses uh, that can be comparable to us. But if you're asking, is there something funny? In the Torah, then yes, there is something funny in the Torah. One example would be the sarcasm of the Jewish people uh, when we left Egypt, and uh, then they uh, tell, uh, you look at the verses, they tell, uh, they complain to Moshe Rabbeinu, and they say, uh, why'd you bring us over here to die? Aren't there any graves and cemeteries in Egypt? Uh, so this is a joke. This is sarcasm, Jewish sarcasm. That they're telling them, you know, if you're going to bring us to die, why don't you just leave us in, uh, you know, in, in Egypt? Oh, maybe it's because there's no cemeteries in Egypt. Meaning they're obviously making a funny. They're, they're, but, uh, but, uh, so this is certainly a funny thing, uh, but that's not necessarily because God has a sense of humor. God doesn't have senses like humans. Uh, but there certainly are certain things you can find that uh, are funny. Our posted notes allowed on Shabbat, uh, just peeling and sticking to mark a page, not for writing on. Uh, no, if if it's a uh, if it's posted notes, usually are stronger uh, sticker than uh, than uh, than that's permissible. Uh, there are uh, certain things that uh, my Rav. Yeah, I'll show you an example. There are things like this that uh, are very, very weak type of uh, adhesive material. They're very, very weak. Like in so many words, like even if you put it on the page, it's it's not going to last very long. Um, so this is something that uh, if you know if you want to be lenient, you can use something like this without an issue. Uh, posted notes are usually much stronger, so that I would not use. Um, but also, you could remember that you could always just fold the page. You could always fold the page, uh, the corner of the page, uh, and uh, you won't need post notes. Or you could just put a uh, napkin, uh, you know, in on that page or a bookmark, and uh, you know, so there's no real need to use the posted notes. How does a person who receives help from Hashem give a portion of tzedakah? Uh, so every person needs to give a, according to their means. Uh, you know, generally speaking, a person should give uh, if they're they're making money and they have more than what they need. They should give ten percent of their income to uh, uh, to publicize Torah, to help uh, Torah scholars, to help more people do tshuva. Uh, but if they are poor and destitute to the point where uh, they don't have uh, any uh, money to eat, uh, then obviously it's not possible for them to give. So it, it all depends. As far as a person receiving help from Hashem, everybody receives help from Hashem. The millionaire, the billionaire, and the uh, poor and destitute. Everybody receives help from Hashem. Uh, but as far as uh, um, how much to give, it all depends. It all depends on a person. It all depends on a person. It all depends on the circumstance too. Sometimes a person... Uh, will not have a uh, standard income uh, that they they don't get paid, let's say, every week or every two weeks, but rather they barely make it, you know, uh, for three, four, five months. But then all of a sudden they get a uh, you know a big uh, amount of money uh, from something in one shot. So during that time when they get the bigger amount of money that's more than what they need, uh, they certainly should give during that time uh, and not think, oh, but you know. Uh, I shouldn't give because maybe I'll have another three, four, five, or six months that I, I won't have money, so I need to survive. Don't don't worry so much about tomorrow if you have food for today. Uh, so, you know, get, a person should give whenever they can. How does a person worship Hashem according to Judaism? I'm a Noahide who came from Christian background. Uh, so I have lectures uh, on the uh, YouTube page 
uh, for Noahides uh, that uh, will certainly help you. Noahides have uh, seven laws. Uh, in so many, uh, seven main laws, like similar to the Ten Commandments that the Jews have, but those seven laws break up into about 50 or 60 uh, different uh, um, uh, uh, laws that are all based on common sense, like honoring your parents, uh, you know, th things that have to do with morals and, and, and behavior, not practices, you know, the... Uh, uh, Noahides are not obligated to uh, pray to God any amount of time uh, per day or to read from uh, uh, the Torah or to read from a Sidhu. Noahides, in so many words, have to not be idol worshippers, not be immoral, no homosexuality, no idolatry, no murder, no stealing, uh, to be, you know, decent people. Now, as far as uh, uh, learning, there is there are lectures uh, on the on the uh, site, and we're actually coming out with a uh, guide, a short guide that's going to show different lectures and different suggested reading for Noahides uh, very soon, probably uh, in maybe the next couple of weeks, possibly sooner. Uh, that uh, will make it easier for people to find some of this stuff on our website and other places. But either way, the uh, ultimate way of serving Hashem uh, is following the laws, trying to publicize God's name and His Torah, helping uh, more people, especially Jews, become Torah observant. Uh, and uh, that's it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's more than enough. It's, you know, a person obviously has to uh, you know, perfect their character. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in the process, meaning if they have character flaws, they have to uh, fix them. Why do people say you have to be born Jewish to be Jewish? Are people allowed to convert or no? Of course, you're allowed to convert to uh, Judaism. In fact, there is a uh, 36 places in the Torah where God says how much he loves and protects uh, those that convert to Judaism. Uh, so uh, certainly you're allowed to uh, convert to Judaism, but a person needs to know what does it mean to be a Jew? Uh, in order to uh, convert. It's not like Christianity or Islam where a person uh, doesn't really realize what he's getting himself into until it's too late because to convert to those religions is so simple. All you pretty much got to do is either throw some filthy uh, water on them or pretty much say a few words you don't even know what they mean and that's it, you become a Christian or a, uh, or a Muslim. In Judaism, it doesn't work that way. In Judaism, it requires a person to make uh, life changes uh, and also uh, gain a certain amount of knowledge uh, in order for them to uh, become a Jew. It's a process that uh, can take, uh, you know, anywhere from, you know, a year to many years, depending on the level of commitment. Uh, it's, not, it's not a one to three process. Not a one to three process. Okay, Tzadikim, thank you very much for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you that learned and uh, is going to apply as much of this to their lives. Bezat Hashem. Uh, remember, anyone that wants to fulfill the mitzvah uh, of Kimcha uh, de Pischa and also be a giver during this uh, time of the uh, year, go to bhpesach.org. bhpesach.org will have uh, a couple of more uh, videos uh, uh, released uh, about this campaign uh, in the next uh, couple of days uh, before the holiday uh, and uh, next week there's not going to be uh, any lectures uh, of course because we have the uh, the holiday in preparation for the holiday but I wish all of you a Chag uh, Pesach Kasher uh, V'Sameach to everyone that's Jewish and all of the uh, non-Jews 
We'll be able to uh, spend the time also getting closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Can't celebrate the holiday of Pesach, but you could certainly celebrate a connection to Hashem, to learn more about Hashem, to do more of the will of Hashem, and Be'ezad Hashem, to publicize Hashem's name in many, many more places around the world. Thank you very much for learning with me. God bless. Be'ezad Hashem, we'll talk soon. Kol Tuf. There's a lot of really cool stuff on our websites, uh, new features, uh, and uh, a lot more uh, projects that are on the way that Be'ezad Hashem will help Am Yisrael get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to publicize HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name and uh, know that He is the one and only God. God.